Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. We mourn for the losses that took place on October 27th, 2018 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when 11 of our fellow Jewry were killed and 7 injured. This took place on Shabbos morning. This was Judophobic anti-Semitism manifested by white racism. We mourn the losses that took place more recently on March 15, 2019 in New Zealand during Friday prayer in the city of Christchurch. This Islamophobic anti-Semitism manifested via white racism and terrorism. This claimed 50 lives and 50 injuries. Also about two months ago, 28-year-old activist Amber Evans vanished. Amber Evans was one of the relevant leading faces of civil rights in today's new civil rights movements that are emerging. And many have speculated about her death. Of course, we too think this might be the doing of the police. Her body was found in an Ohio River on March 25th, 2019. Now, there are a lot of things said, but there are a lot of people that maintain that this was the work of the police. We can't be sure that it was the work of the police, but the way we have to think is that it's more likely than it was. We have to start thinking in those terms. If we start, if we continue to think in terms it's less likely, things will continue to happen. This is what they do to the nonviolent. Now we mourn her murder despite disagreements in some of her politics. Well, I mean, we're not opposed to all of her politics. She, she advocated for a lot of good things too. Um, she is not the enemy. But those that did this to her, they are the enemy. The enemy murders women in cold blood. The enemy preys upon black people because they're scared of black people. White privilege is afraid of black liberation. And it's time for European Jewry to decide whether we're with the rest of our fellow Jewry, as the Jewish nation is not ethnic or racial. It is very rainbow-colored. You know, brown, yellow, black, white, olive, like the best way to, like, it's spread out like that. The Jewish nation has never, ever been an ethnic nation. And this is what they do to the nonviolent. It's not high, in high circulation, but as far as the Christchurch shooting, this was done live streamed on Facebook, and uh, the President of the United States does not want to verbally refer to white terrorism as terrorism because the president consistently uh, invokes the concept of Islamic terrorism, even though Islamic terrorism is actually extremely rare. There are several people that believe, like credible people that believe, like they believe, and, and I'm talking about people with the credentials, I'm not talking about some type of populist conspiracy theories. I mean, people with real credentials are under the impression that the uh, the ISIL or ISIS, um, ISIL meaning uh, Islamic State of Syria and the Levant, or um, I'm not sure what ISIS would stand for, so let's just go with ISIL, um, Daesh, that the Daesh group, um, there are many people that believe that it's a complete and total proxy of the United States of America and the State of Israel. Now, I have some pretty fixed views about that that are not going to be presented. Now, I did read The Great Replacement. That's the manifesto written by the, the Christchurch shooter. And I don't think I can... See, the problem is, is I don't like the fact that it's censored. I, I don't believe it's going to inspire a bunch of uppity people to do stuff. Because if that's the case, I mean, what about the Turner Diaries? And, you know, which was a fiction book, you know, Timothy McVeigh. I mean, look, the fact of the matter is, the reason why they censor it is because the white supremacist who did this was pro-Zionist. One of the big cover-ups in our society, and it is a cover-up if you pay attention, I'm not saying conspiracy, and the fact that I even have to clarify that to anybody is this shows you how badly truth, real truth, actual what is factual information is under assault. 
And the reason for this is they fear revolution. By they, who is they? The establishment, the capitalists, the people who have money, families with children who have money, who want families with children that don't have money to die. That is the truth. There is class warfare. If you deny that, it's like, it's like shunning math. Saying there's no class warfare is the same thing as shunning math. Um, shunning the reality that there is class-based conflict is like saying physics is not true. There are things you cannot take on faith. And one of them is the fact that the wealthy elites would like capitalism to stay in place so that poor people continue to serve them. Because all you have to think about it is a person that gets off on a bunch of people dancing in the fashion that he asks to be danced. You know, like like if you, you see a person who has a bunch of people surrounded and they're giving him his birthday party every day, that's very much how the top capitalists are. They are narcissistic. There are there that that may seem weird to people. They may need to fill the void with bizarre, you know, populist conspiracy theories, but the fact is that no, you just have to think about what would you do if you had all the money in the world and you had no real values. If your values were if your values were to keep up profits and to have the great cars and for your children to inherit those cars. Well, you know who you'd be. You know who you'd be if you were raised like that. You'd be kind of like forgive the euthanism, but you'd be like a um I feel like a sadistic... I don't have a youth business. No one came to mind, it's not there. Anyway, I, I'd like to make this a happier moment. A more chipper movement. A, a chipper moment. I'm um, sure most of you are familiar with me. My name is Comrade Net Ben Yehoshua. I am the Cleric of Public Relations. And I am here with Donna Newman, our Emissary of Solidarity. Hi, everyone! Brenton Tarrant, the... Christchurch uh, mosque shooter. They wrote something that was to the effect of a context that several of us had warned people about. I mean to say that we tried to explain that white nationalism would ally with Zionism. Brenton Tarrant said some things that we feel should be cross-examined in order to fight against this threat in the future. You know, um, well, what do you think, Donna? There is no reason why we shouldn't just round up the matter to an inquiry as to what made this momser so incredibly subhuman, but simply telling the truth can get a strike. I agree, telling the truth can get us a strike on our channel, as anyone can, for the most part, flag a YouTube video on false claims. And then YouTube's community, or those that would investigate it, or those that have the power to, they neglect to properly investigate the matter. And when they do, by bypassing their own terms and services, they will concede to false claims out of fear of lawsuits. Or worse, YouTube's community or whatever, you know, investigators, when they do um, that investigation, they all will often discriminate and then bypass their own terms and services. Can no longer self-censor. In the course and development of colonialist Western thought, there have been multiple splits, but the core notion it retains is the reactionary ideology of whiteness. Classical fascism was rooted in hypernationalism 
and then splintered into the realm of Strasserism, National Bolshevism, European and White Chauvinism, Zionism, etc., 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 all with their own associated fringe thinking. Quote unquote logic, quote unquote, that at best will identify a fact and then develop reactionary rationale to explain it, or at worst, will utilize baseless non factual populism to weaponize ignorance against an innocent, otherized populace. With the advent of neo-colonialism and its predecessor, bourgeois liberalism, a form of parentalistic white supremacy had evolved to justify the exploitation of the colonized nations and the proletariat entire. But in the process of evolving from one to the next, it was recognized that the white settler population must be giving tutological pro-white justification to keep them separate from the oppressed and colonized peoples. We in the Bundes movement are fully aware that Sit Lai of the Mechika movement has gone her separate way from the Mechika movement. You can still find her on her personal channel, Nikent Tlaka Women Warriors. And yes, we support Nikent Tlaka liberation struggles. And we hold the right to do so without being accused of endorsing Mayanism. Nikent Tlaka activism is not Mayanism. And that is not meant to be an assault on Mayanism, just to be clear. So we bring you to this video, and this video that we are putting here is actually an endorsement to the Machika movement, but it is done through the mouth of Sit La Yi, who probably was one of the best members when she was in the Machika movement, and she's still a wonderful person. Of course, we support the Machika movement, and we have reasons for this that will be put into bigger detail in the next video. This video is called Colonialism and Emotion, Sit La Yi of the Machika Movement. This video was published on September 30th, 2015. Collectivity. I've been really thinking about who we are as a people, where we are historically today, the battles that we are facing, the colonialism that we face every day, and it just hits you because you realize that we have been systematically kept away from each other, from uniting with each other, from uniting as a people, as a community, as whatever relativity that we have as a people on our continent. And it's very sad because without an established unity, we are being suckered into colonial identities and colonial realities and colonial illusions of success and standards of education and beauty and there's so much being thrown at us uh, to diminish us to diminish to belittle our identity to belittle our integrity to belittle our dignity as a people and i just wanted to make kind of some comments on this whole reality because a lot of us we don't think long term we think you know it's hard because we're working we're going to school uh whatever you might have problems with your family life is hard as is when we're under this occupation and we have this uh very uh oppressive and suffocating system of colonial capitalism but, you know, I just want to encourage everyone to, to let's wake up every day thinking of the future, thinking of what we can do to better our reality, to better our people's condition. What can we learn? What can we teach? What can we study? What can we say? What can we present? What message can we bring? You know, and it's really hard because everything, the majority of these institutions and these systems are not there to nurture a decolonizing perspective review. And, you know, colonialism, it's an ongoing thing. We're all colonized at so many different levels. None of us is 100% free of colonialism. 
But we have to just try to create an awareness with our own selves and with our own lives, with our own sanity, because people are going to make you feel like you're crazy or you live in another world or, you know, and we have to take that and say, yeah, we do live in another world. We live in a world where we're not going to be dictated by white supremacy, where white supremacy is not going to stamp everything we say, everything we think, everything we we desire everything we dream of and so you know this 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 concept of unity this concept of of coming together as a people is is powerful it's 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 gonna surpass centuries of genocide and colonialism and i say this because like i said it, it's hard sometimes when, when you're out there and you're talking about this and um, and then you kind of just wonder, like, do people get this? Does it make sense? You know, and, and it's really hard because a lot of us, a lot of our people, we don't have the awareness of history, the awareness of how history happens. And we don't, since we have not lived certain experiences or certain realities, we automatically assume it's not possible and it's not realistic. And we rob ourselves of that imagination of believing, not even believing, but embracing a world of that is indigenous focused, that is Nicantlaca. And when we're trying to create this reality, again, we're we're coming across and we're being um, completely bulldozered by by white supremacy, whether it's at work or school. And we're really trying to shove, we're trying to push our way through this system, push our way through work, push our way through school, and just realize, you know, that we represent a historical struggle. We represent a survival of a people that are not meant to be here, not meant to survive, mixed blood or full blood, whatever type of quantum, you are not supposed to be here, according to the agenda of white supremacy. And so for us to understand that, it kind of, you know, when we wake up every day, you know, let's try to bring in that positivity because it could be very discouraging. It could be very demoralizing. It could be very um, frustrating at times. And it's like, how do we maintain this, this calm? How do we maintain this peace? And I just wanted to share that because I think a lot of my videos, you know, I get very um, historical and dates and facts and definitions and stuff. But there's a huge emotional aspect to this. There's a huge mental um, aspect to this whole process of colonialism and decolonization. And I just wanted to share that because, it, you know, I got to be real. I got to be real with you guys. And I got to be real with myself and say, this is hard. You know, this is not easy. If it were easy, we would be free and not take five centuries. But Either way, we have to keep in mind that we are warriors. We are out there. You know, let's support each other. Let's encourage each other as warriors. Let's support each other. Um, it's really important because outside of, of our circle of warriors, you enter this realm of just venom, you know, of just attacks, of just hate, of just, you know, even within our own community, people dissing each other, people saying, oh, that's unrealistic. Get over it. It's never going to happen. So there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of uh, put downs and and you know and 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 it's sad because it's like that's really what's keeping our liberation from happening is besides the ignorance of our community. But we have to think historically. We really do have to appreciate the fact that we at this time, at this point of your age, whatever age you are, the fact that you are learning your history, the fact that you are getting decolonized, that's a huge gift um, of resistance. That's a huge gift of warriors. And we have to nurture that gift. We have to embrace that gift. And we need to share that gift. And that gift is not meant for us to go around and put other warriors down or go, you know, policing our own community. But it's about us you know, sharing that information, sharing that knowledge, making yourself available to teach, to learn, to study, and maintaining that humility, you know, because a lot of people, they come across this knowledge, and all of a sudden, it's like they know everything. They want to tell you how to dress, how to look, what to say, and it's like, this is a, a struggle of a lifetime, you know, and doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter um, how decolonized you say you are, what it really boils down to is what are we doing for our people? 
with all that knowledge, with all that, you know, all these people online, right? That they have this courage and they want to start all this ruckus and stuff. But what are we doing? What are we doing every day in our life to better our situation? How are we helping each other out? How are we building connections? How are we building bridges within our own people? Because again, this landmass, this is our continent. We're like surrounded by our people, surrounded by who we are, but we are not given that that image, right? And so I just wanted to talk about it because it, it gets heavy. You know, it gets heavy when you start thinking about this and you start learning, especially at the very, I would say the first two, three years, that's when you really, it hits you hard. It hits you hard. Decolonization is kind of like a, a detox and the detox just doesn't end. You know, everything you've been taught, you've been indoctrinated with, that um, the majority of our parents in ignorance taught us, our grandparents. So there's this, this, this thread of just, bitterness and sourness that comes with this because you're just so disgusted with how evil and how disgusting this European culture has been to our people and it's sedated through materialism and sedated through drugs and sedated through all this bullshit that they give us it's hard for us to to really realize and recognize just how fucked up we are you know, and again, this is not to say be all like negative and stuff, but I, I'm being real. Like that's that's the reality that we come across. So how do we get to that realization and how do we pull the the positive and pull the love and pull the strength and cur out of us and into our community? You know, because again, knowing who we are, decolonizing, it is a gift, but it's also a responsibility. And we have to nur nurture that gift. We have to share it. We need to let the world know we're here. We need to be there for each other. Um, I just wanted to share that because it's just, um, it's a lot. It's a lot of things to consider. It's a lot of things that we go through. But again, you know, we have to be compassionate. We have to be considerate. We have to be respectful. And we keep going. You know, uh, I get a lot of hate mail, yada, yada. You should do this. You should do that. Why are you this? Why is your lips red? Like, bullshit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, image and whatever. I'm not here to live up to anyone's standard of what I should sound like, look like, talk like, any of that. I'm here to represent a message of liberation that I've learned through the Mexica movement for the last 18 years of my life. And I'm here to try to make this understandable, make it transparent, like this message. I want to make it as clear as possible as I'm learning, as I'm growing, as I'm decolonizing. I'm hoping to share that with my people. And this YouTube, this shit right here, this box, this computer, this is a tool for decolonization, this is a tool for us to communicate with other warriors and say, no, you're not crazy, brother and sister. This is a system of white supremacy. And we in the Mexica movement know that. And we're here on YouTube and we're here um, protesting and we're protesting the Serra canonization and we're protesting Columbus Day and we make events and we go to high schools and we go to universities. We are trying our best with whatever we can to make this message accessible to our people. We go out to the community. We are very transparent with who we are, what we look like, what we say, what our points of views are. It's all here. And it all stems from the love of our people because we love our people because our people deserve the truth because we know what it's like to be ignorant. We know what it's like to be colonized. We know what it's like to be stuck on some real fucked up white supremacist venom poison. And we want to help our people out of that. There's nothing more beautiful than knowing that we are waking people up. You know, I get tons of messages from teenagers that come to me and they thank me, um, thank the organization for the message, for knowing. Finally, they say, I know who I am. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's what this is about. This is about us learning who we are and waking up and embracing that knowledge and embracing that realization. So I know it was all over the place, but I really wanted to just share with you that part because I've I've had this inside for a while and I just wanted to have a conversation with you and in a, in a sense have a conversation with myself because you as an indigenous person are a reflection of me and I am of you so with that um 
Tasso Gamati for your support, for your love, for your courage. Um, yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep decolonizing. Tasso Gamati, Sitlali from the Mexican movement. Keep strong, stay awake. Brenton Tarrant wrote a manifesto that is censored from the internet. The real reason for this is because most white supremacists openly say the very things he writes in his filthy manifesto. He poses what he feels others would ask him in this manifesto with answers to these questions. I'm going to go through some of them for you right now. The question, he, the question he puts here to himself is, did the group you support are did the groups you support slash are aligned with other to promote your attack he answers no no group ordered my attack I make the decision myself though I did contact the reborn Knights Templar for a blessing in support of the attack which was given there's no reason to doubt that by the way there's no reason to think that Brenton Tarrant was not given such a blessing by Templars as Anders Brevik was clearly a Templar. And yeah, the Telegraph came out with something saying don't call t and uh, Anders uh, Brevik a, a terrorist and that his Templar group was fictional. But anybody who knows what the... What is the Telegraph? It's an anti-Semitic newspaper. And it's never really written anything that was true. Ever. <laughs> was the attack anti-immigration in origin? He replies to himself, yes, beyond all doubt, anti-immigration, anti-ethnic replacement, and anti-cultural replacement. B basically, fictions about white genocide. Amazing. How sick, how sick this guy is. This Brenton Tarrant truly is sick and twisted and very subhuman. He fails to mention how European power has created America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Israel, the Spanish oligarchy over Mexico and South America, how the white power structure is devastating the Muslim world. I mean, he completely doesn't mention why there's all this immigration from the Middle East. Where are you an anti-Semite? He replies, no. Okay, so he asks himself, where are you, where slash are you an anti-Semite? His response is no. Actually, he is. He is very anti-Semitic. He doesn't care about the genocide that the American power structure is doing to the Middle East, or what NATO has done to the Middle East. He doesn't care about that. I mean, he does say a lot of weird stuff. This, this, the thing is, um... His book, The Great Replacement, is extremely incoherent. So he asks himself, Where are you an anti-Semite? His reply to himself, No, a Jew living in Israel is no enemy of mine, so long as they do not seek to subvert or harm my people. So white nationalism reveals itself to be the master to its neocolonial puppet Zionism through Brenton Tarrant. You see the anti-Semitic Zionism of Brenton Tarrant? Do you see it? Where are you a conservative? He asks himself, where slash are you a conservative? He has replied to this as no, conservatism is corporatism in disguise. I want no part of it. Stupid answer. Corporatism is the fascism of Mussolini. Why does everyone try to rebrand corporatism? Shh, <laughs> seriously. Where are you a fat? Where slash are you a fascist? Yes, for once the person that will be called a fascist is an actual fascist. I sure, I am sure the journalists will love that. <laughs> I mostly agree with Sir Oswald Mosley's views and consider myself an echo fascist by nature. The nation with the closest political and social values to my own is the People's Republic of China. And by the way, for the record, China is socialist only in name. 
but it is not socialist in practice. And let me be clear here, it is not Marxist-Leninist in practice anymore. The Mao Zedong's Maoist... The, 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 the Marxist-Leninist... The Mao Zedong thought China no longer exists. I do want to make that clear. So just for the record, China is socialist only in name, but it is not socialist in pra practice. So, so China is not socialist in practice, and also the classical fascism of Sir Oswald Mosley would count as corporatism. Yes, the, the fascism of Sir Oswald Mosley is the same thing as Mussolini's corporatism. I don't know if anybody realizes that. So he has said that he is against, cons he's against corporatism but he himself is admitting to being a corporatist. That's incredible. Was there a political figure or party in history you most associate yourself with? He asks himself this question and again he answers himself. Sir Oswald Mosley in... So he asks, his, he asks himself, was there a political figure or party in history you most associate yourself with, he answers himself with, Sir Oswald Mosley is the person from history closest to my own beliefs. Thus, Brenton Tarrant confesses himself as being a corporatist just after denouncing corporatism. Disc, disc. There's a lot more junk in there, but that's just the incoherency of it. It's just the same way where David Duke followers say that they hate a state, they, they hate the state of Israel, and yet one of the biggest endorsements that Donald Trump got was from David Duke, even though who was giving the most of the pro-Zionist position was David Duke during his entire campaign. Thus, it sh thus that's why we know David Duke is in fact a Zionist. Because true white supremacists are Zionists. But is Zionism white supremacy? Well, Zionism is actually neo-colonialism. Um, is it fascist? Oh yes. Is it Nazi? Well, the Kah well several Kahanists say that they are Jewish National Socialists. So several Kahanists are saying that they're Jewish Nazis. So that's harder to answer, but it's definitely neo-colonialist. There's going to be a, a point where we're going to breach the problem of Kahanism. But that just shows you the sickness that is Brenton Tarrant. And this next video will be featuring Richard Silverstein, who has rather bad blood with myself and Donna Newman. Nonetheless, what he says in this video is pretty decent. And to drive home the point about the sickness and degenerate uh, subhuman nature of Brenton Tarrant, um, it is important for you to watch this video from the Real News Network called Why Do Far-Right White Nationalists Support Zionism, which was published on October 25th, 2017. The success of Sebastian Kurz in Austria's recent election means that the extreme right Freedom Party, the FPÖ, will likely join the governing coalition. Populist right-wing parties are on the rise in many European countries in recent years. These parties include the Party of Freedom in the Netherlands, headed by Geert Wilders, the National Front in France, headed by Marine Le Pen, the Sweden Democrats, headed by Jimmy Ackeson, and more. Although highly nationalistic in their politics, these right-wing parties are very similar to each other. They share an Islamophobic and xenophobic ideology, and very interestingly, they all share a strong support for Zionism and for the State of Israel. Michael Colborn wrote an article for the Haaretz newspaper with the title Rise of a New Far Right, the European Philosemites Using Jews to Battle Muslims to address the seeming contradiction in the European Far Right. Indeed, there really is no difference between philosemitism and anti-Semitism. There is no such thing as positive racism. The Far Right groups did not replace their hatred of Jews with the hatred of Muslims. They continue to hate both groups. Richard Silverstein told The Real News about how the election of President Trump emboldened those groups in the United States. I think that the anti-Semites in the United States are affiliated with the alt-right movement that you uh, correctly associated with Breitbart. And uh, this alt-right movement includes a, a, 
a very big cadre of anti-Semites, and they feel empowered by uh, Trump's victory and his uh, nativist kind of populist uh, extremist kind of uh, views. And that's why a lot of these anti-Semitic attacks are happening. And they're very much linked to the attacks on the Muslim community, which is why American Jews should really be making common cause with Muslims. White nationalism has its roots in Europe in the 19th century, as it developed and took form in order to serve as justification for European colonialism. In those European countries that had smaller and fewer colonies, such as Germany, Italy, and Hungary, white nationalism turned inwards in the form of fascism, implementing the strict hierarchical colonial structure on their own citizens. It sought to find its enemies within and turned on minorities. During the Second World War, an unprecedented industrial genocide was perpetrated against Jews, against Sinti and Roma, against homosexuals and lesbians, against people with mental disabilities and against others who were deemed enemies of the state. Since Jews were targeted above all other groups during this genocide, and since the State of Israel, which was founded three years after the Holocaust, defines itself as a Jewish state, it raises the question of why does the European racist right wing support the State of Israel? Aren't they on completely opposite sides? There are two explanations for this. One is that the Zionist movement and the State of Israel seek to convince Jews from all over the world to migrate to the State of Israel. The prospect of European Jews and North American Jews leaving their homes and moving to the Middle East appeals to many racist groups. The second explanation for the alliance between the Western Far Right and the State of Israel is that Israeli policies towards immigrants, towards Arabs and towards Muslims are precisely the kind of policies that the European and North American Far Right would like to implement. President Trump, during his campaign for the presidency, commented on Fox and Friends on how the U.S. can and should imitate Israeli racial profiling. Our local police, they know who a lot of these people are. They're afraid to do anything about it because they, they don't want to be accused of, uh, of uh, profiling and they don't want to be accused of all sorts of things. You know, in Israel, they profile. They've done a, an unbelievable job, as good as you can do. Sure. Uh, but Israel has done an unbelievable job, and they'll profile. They profile. They see somebody that's suspicious, they will profile, they will take that person in, they'll check out, do we have a choice? Look what's going on. Do we really have a choice? We're trying to be so politically correct in our country, mm -hmm. and this is only going to get worse. In the European context, fear of immigration fuels the extreme right. Leah Tarachansky told The Real News how Israeli policies towards asylum seekers inspire the European right. So the African refugees, like the Palestinian laborers, pay taxes to the state of Israel while they receive absolutely no services whatsoever from the state of Israel. They don't get shelters, they don't get uh, basic uh, food uh, supplies, they don't get health care, zero, nothing. So on top of paying taxes to a government that does not provide them with any services, they are now going to have these wages taken. And as far as I know, and I'm of course not a refugee expert, no other country does that. Uh, now, you have to understand that Israel actually promotes itself to Europe, uh, which is currently seen as in a crisis of migration, as the frontier of effective policies on how to basically prevent migrants from coming into your borders. So Israel is using this as yet another tool in its marketing campaign that it's trying to convince other Western nations, other developed nations, to adopt in their attack on the globalized um, migration. The current wave of right-wing nationalism in Europe has adopted the prejudice that all Jews are Zionists. They invite European and American Jews to join their movement against what they perceive is the common Muslim enemy. The vast majority of European and American Jews, however, reject this invitation. They may be invited to the feast for now, but they know that it is the Jews themselves who will be served for dessert. This was engineered by the ruling class so the white masses would stand in defense of the white bourgeoisie and in turn protect their own standing and relative privilege in relation to the white colonial power. This privilege by proxy is the foundation of colonialism and imperialism. 
in that large swaths of white settlers were made into collaborators with the white ruling class. And being that the white settlers had no real concrete resources to differentiate themselves from the other proletariat, their answer was to develop a community interwoven with white supremacy. That is, the concept that whiteness is superior by design, without any innate merit in its own right, means that the white quote-unquote proletariat quote-unquote had no innate qualities it could construct as valid. It had to devise its own subjective and ridiculous criteria as to what was considered superior. As time went on, logical justification of this had to be made, and as such an ideology of falsehoods and myth was formed as a measure and means of preserving their institutions and power, power that they were given for their cooperation with the white ruling class in exchange for oppressing the colonized nations. And we end this presentation with the first part of a trilogy featured on AJ+. I bring you to an AJ+, video titled What's feeling far-right hate in America? So again, this video is titled, What's Fueling Far-Right Hate in America? And this was published on February 19th of 2019. We're not letting them in, but they're trying to flood our country. The nation faces a major threat. But it's not the one President Donald Trump is talking about. What is the biggest threat to the United States right now? Well, I think on the terrorism front, it's white supremacists. More people have been killed by white supremacists since 9-11 than by people who, you know, believe these kind of extremist, twisted forms of Islam. In 2006, there were six incidents of terror-related violence on U.S. soil. In 2017, that number was 65. That's a nearly 1,000% increase in a decade, and most of those are the result of far-right violence. The last few years alone have given us several high-profile examples, like the Pittsburgh synagogue attack, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville that saw a woman killed, and the Charleston Church massacre. That's our major goal is we want an all-white nation. We want, you know, it, because we believe we're the superior race, we believe that we were here first. This display of violence has been decades in the making. And for years, some have been trying to warn us about this very moment. Hey fam, I'm Imayan. In part one of our three-part series, we're taking a look at the explosion of far-right extremism and looking at what, if anything, the government has done to combat it. This is America. Scenes like this have become more commonplace because groups like these are more prevalent. The United States is in the middle of a surge of far-right violence. Two-thirds of politically motivated violent attacks in 2017 were tied to far-right-wing ideologies. It's the increase in these types of attacks that interests Heidi Byron. She's an expert on extremism and for years has been studying the growth of right-wing violence in the U.S. And we've agreed not to disclose her location for safety. Usually far-right extremism is exemplified by two things. Either extreme anti-government positions, and by that I don't mean like low taxes, I mean literally opposed to sort of the federal government and the idea that it exists. And then it, as you get more radical on the far right, you start having notions of white supremacy and racism become part of uh, the thinking. Globally, the number of attacks dropped between 2014 to 2017. But recently, the United States has seen a surge in what's been called terror-related violence by the Global Terrorism Database. And Byrick says the far right increase happening in the US right now is also occurring in some European nations because of a commonality all these countries share. Where you're seeing far-right movements increase 
is where you have a white population that feels under threat by growing minority or immigrant populations. And so the problem with white supremacist terrorism isn't going to go away. Most of the 65 ideologically extreme incidents that happened in 2017 were linked to anti-government, fascist, anti-Muslim, homophobic, anti-Semitic, or anti-immigrant motivations. Like the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where a driver rammed a car into a crowd of counter-protesters, killing anti-racist protester Heather Heyer. That rally included members of the alt-right, neo-Nazis, and white nationalists. And right now, we're about to meet the man who tried to warn the country about this far-right swell way before it even happened. Daryl Johnson is the man who told the U.S. government it should brace for a resurgence of right-wing violence all the way back in 2009. You know, on the Republican side, there was absolutely no interest in listening to what we had to say, uh, which I thought was sad. And what I find staggering is that, you know, I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican, and yet I could call out this threat for what it is. So Johnson foresaw this, but what made him predict it? I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of president to the United States faithfully. But it wasn't until we had the 2008 election that we saw a resurgence in these groups. We had the first time African-American president, which really agitated a lot of the racist groups. This was kind of their worst nightmare come true. And then we also had the economic downturn in 08, which provided fertile ground for a lot of people to join anti-government groups. Johnson was so worried about a rise in right-wing extremism, he testified before Congress in 2012. His testimony came in a post-9-11 nation when the U.S. government focused heavily on al-Qaeda. For Johnson, this wasn't some partisan issue. He was a third-generation Republican trying to highlight what he saw as a security threat. Eight members of the Hootery, an extremist militia in Michigan that were acquitted this year of plotting to kill police officers and planting bombs at their funerals, had an arsenal of weapons at their disposal that was larger than all 230 plus Muslim plotters and attackers charged in the U.S. since 9-11 combined. The reward the government gave Johnson and his team was retracting their report and dismantling the team that created it. For decades, the U.S. government has poured money into programs to fight what it calls violent extremists and terrorism. But those are terms which it doesn't even apply consistently. For you, supporting Here's you. President Trump talking about a mass shooting a white man committed that killed 26 people in Sutherland Spring, Texas in November 2017. I think that uh, mental health is your problem here. This was a very, based on preliminary reports, very deranged individual. A lot of problems over a long period of time. And here he is talking about allegedly religiously motivated violence. We are also taking strong measures to protect our nation from radical Islamic terrorism. Most governmental programs have focused almost entirely on Muslims, not only stigmatizing that group, but also paying very little attention to what statistics show is the actual threat. White far-right violence, which doesn't often earn the label of terrorism or extremism, hasn't been the government's priority. But you don't have to take my word for it. Take a look at how the nation spends its money. We don't really know how much the country has spent on its so-called global war on terror, because the U.S. doesn't have an accurate accounting of the funds. But one report estimates that from 2002 to 2017, the U.S. government spent $2.8 trillion on wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Even as funding declined in 2017 from previous levels, the government still spent $175 billion that year. While the nation was shelling out all that money on what it says was countering foreign threats to America, the rate of right-wing domestic attacks increased nearly six-fold from the 2000s to the 2010s. What did you recommend in your testimony that the government should do? I recommended that they look at domestic terrorism definition that's codified in our laws because right now it it's doesn't really fit the definition of what domestic terrorism is, so that leads to confusion. I also recommended that we need to have federal uh, dollars devoted to training state and local law enforcement uh, on these types of threats. 
but to this day, really nothing that I recommended has been implemented. And there's something else that's happened since Johnson has given his congressional testimony that's fueled the rise of far-right hate. If I was still in the movement, I would be doing what everybody else is doing too. I'd be voting for Trump because he's saying all the right stuff. Jason Downard is a former neo-Nazi who became involved with the group when he was convicted for his role in a 2009 drive-by shooting. Now that you have somebody like Donald Trump, it's about what he's saying. He, and he's the president of the United States of America. So you get these neo-Nazis like, oh, we got this president. is pretty much giving us the OK to do whatever the hell we want. He's not the only one who thinks President Trump bears some responsibility for the current wave of far-right fanaticism. He sort of activated them in a way that they hadn't been before. Uh, and this is sort of the tragedy of the Trump era. Critics have skewered Trump for failing to respond clearly and firmly to far-right violence. Here's what he said after that deadly attack in Charlottesville. I think there's blame on both sides. You look at, you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. He's also identified as a nationalist, which some see as a wink and a nod to those who call themselves white nationalists. So anti-racist critics find it difficult to believe Trump's being sincere when he says, We will reject bigotry and hatred and oppression. Instead of putting the government's focus on the right's growing extremism, Trump's then Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, made it a mission to crack down on so-called black identity extremists. Thank you all. This business with black identity extremists is a classic example of where the federal government under Trump is focusing on something that doesn't exist. And the report that was leaked that talked about this issue and talked about how there's a rising threat from black identity extremists basically has no factual backing. The FBI even did a 12-page report on so-called black identity extremist groups. It says we're targeting law enforcement. Here's what they didn't do a report on. Has the FBI done a report on white identity extremists that are likely motivated to target law enforcement officers? Um, Is there I'm not aware of that. Meanwhile, far-right groups like the Sovereign Citizens actually have targeted law enforcement. They have a significant threat to law enforcement, especially during traffic stops and other unplanned encounters, because a lot of these groups look at law enforcement as kind of being the foot soldiers of a tyrannical government. They view uh, law enforcement as kind of like the government intrusion on their lives. This administration's pursuit of so-called black identity extremism has drawn comparisons to J. Edgar Hoover's infamous COINTELPRO. It was a covert action program that relied on infiltration, dirty tricks, and even violence to neutralize dissidents like Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Panthers. Newton's last trial and manslaughter conviction were over Trump's response to far-right extremism is set against this historically blemished backdrop. What is the FBI pursuing in terms of domestic terrorism? Nobody knows. Like, we don't know, are there a thousand open cases on this topic? We have no information. So it's really hard to say the government should be doing X if we don't even know what the government's been doing. And then there's the fact that the Trump administration nixed a grant to fund a group fighting far-right violence. In the waning days of his presidency, Barack Obama awarded $10 million to 31 groups countering violent extremism. Only one of those organizations was focused on fighting far-right extremism, life after hate. Then Donald Trump took office. His administration reevaluated all the grants. He ended up giving out only 12 and didn't dole out the $400,000 grant previously earmarked for life after hate. The distorted narrative of far-right extremism has deep roots within the birth of this nation. Well, you know, the country was founded on the idea of racial supremacy. One thing that's interesting is a lot of the white supremacists who are active in the United States today Really, what they ask for when they want a white homeland, they're hearkening back to a period that was real, right? Where white men made all the decisions and, you know, pretty much made life horrible for uh, the rest of the populations in the United States. But if we're really looking to understand the growth and effect of far right extremism in our society today, we've got to take a look at our past. And we don't even have to travel too far back. Going back to the decade of Doc Martens and dial up is far enough. Four elements that I have to uh, uh, 
receive information regarding him. Holy cow. About a third of the building has been blown away. Everything went totally dark and I was knocked out of my chair. That seemed to all happen at once. Right-wing hatred is the cause of the deadliest act of domestic political violence in U.S. history. And the face of that attack wasn't the one Americans initially searched for. Well, am I, am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? So what happens when far-right violence meets an unprepared government? The federal government of the United States must take full responsibility for Oklahoma City. Hey fam, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and be sure to stay tuned next week when we release part two of our series, We're Headed to Oklahoma City. I hope to see you there.